Um, but for now, we have a wonderful new session called Monetizing Your Game Soundtracks. And this uh, came about um, basically to teach um, developers and uh, audio developers how to make an extra buck off your sound that you're creating for games already. Um, and here to tell you about that is um, Greg Ron and a few others on this panel. Um, so a little bit about Greg. He is a, an award-winning composer and sound designer. He's been creating sound for music and music for TV, video games, social games, and mobile phones for over 16 years. His work can be heard on over 170 game titles. And uh, he has clients such as Zynga, Playdom, PopCap, EA, all the big ones, Disney. He specializes in creating immersive soundscapes that are cohesive and highly entertaining for the end user. Mr. Greg Ron, everyone please welcome him to the stage. Thank you very much. As Aaron said, my name is Greg and we're gonna talk about monetizing your game soundtracks. Uh, I've, I've got three experienced composers that are going to talk about various ways that they've been monetizing their soundtracks. Um, we have Brian Cho from Booyah Games. Hello. We have, yeah. We have David Weiner from Atomicon. And your host, your host for the day, Aaron Waltz, is also going to talk about his monetizing efforts and successes. Before we jump into that, I want to just put this whole social game scene in perspective a little bit. Um, we're talking about music now, okay? So XM Radio has 18 million subscribers. Top 40 Radio has 80 million listeners per month on a monthly basis. 80 million, so that's pop radio, that's pretty big. Studioville alone has 80 million month monthly players. And Cityville also has a soundtrack. So 80 million monthly players are hearing that soundtrack every time they play, of course, unless they hit the mute button, but we won't go there right now. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a little graph to kind of illustrate how things are stacking up. You can see Sirius XM and then Top 4 Radio. Uh, social games, 250 million monthly active users. I got that number from Zynga. That's just Zynga alone. So that gives you an idea of uh, the level of popularity all this stuff is, is experiencing. Um, here's a little bit of fan mail. Uh, one of the first things I noticed when I bought the Ramp Champ iPhone game was how original and meticulously crafted the music was. Just like the game graphics, the music is in a class of its own. Even if you're not familiar with the game, this album stands on its own, and if you love the game like I do, I don't know how you could resist owning these gems. Accolades to the composers. Here's one for uh, Ravenwood Fair. Hello, I was wondering if there was any way I could get the track from Ravenwood Fair. I love it so much. Uh, the music of City Wonder on Facebook is so soothing, I think I'm just going to let it run for a while. So this user is going to use it as background music for his day, I guess. You know, it's, he's turned it into a radio. <laughs> Dear Creator, uh, Brian, is this one from yeah, Nightclub, Nightclub City. City? Okay. Dear Creator, I love the music choices that, are, uh, that there is in this game, but I would really love to download some of these songs from the game, but it frustrates me that I'm not able to find any of these songs on iTunes or Frostware. So I was wondering if there would be any way to help download these songs, maybe find a way to post them on iTunes, because I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person that would like this. I hope you can help me to help others as well. So there's a demand there, obviously. Not all the 250 million users are going to be ex expressing this demand, but a small percentage of that is still a large number of people. So, with that in mind, I'm going to turn this over to David Wiener from Atomicon. Yeah, I think, well, actually, I'm going to stand up here. Thank you. So, uh, my name's David, and uh, I run a small music and sound design company in uh, Portland called Atomicon. I also work at a record distribution company. I'm the manager of digital distribution there, also in Portland. Um, and I'm a musician myself and a composer. So um, what I want to talk about is how, as a developer, you can actually make money with music. How many people in here are actually 
developers and how many are music people? Developers, raise hands, or people? Music people? So Okay, so mostly music people. Okay, so then this is going to be more aimed at uh, things that you could potentially pitch to your developer clients. Um, essentially, uh, you know, how do you make money from music? Well, you, you sell it, right? Or you provide access to it, or you license it. Um, so as a game developer, how does, how does a game developer approach the sale of music? Because they're not music sellers, they're game sellers, they're game creators. Um, well, there's actually the same way that a music provider would. You, they sell it, or they can provide access to it. Um, so as, as we mentioned, there's, you know, most games have music, and some of that music is good, and some of that is not so good. But uh, what we want to do is provide developers with a way that they can actually make some money off of the music that they've commissioned or um, acquired and licensed to use. So um, there, there is some historical context behind actually selling soundtracks. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not just game soundtracks, obviously, that people are interested in. People have been buying soundtracks uh, dating back to like vaudeville and Broadway and, and obviously feature films, you know. Um, people buy soundtrack albums to this day for even games now, console games and uh, PC games. People are selling the soundtracks. Some of them have been quite successful. Um, in the past 10 years, really, in this country, game soundtracks have been uh, sold on a larger scale, but in Japan, they've been buying soundtracks for games for decades. Um, I think it's sort of a situation now in this country where there's a large opportunity for future growth in the area. I don't, I don't think many people are monetizing game soundtracks. Um, but, you know, there have been now game, con uh, game music concerts done by classical orchestras. Uh, in the past few years, uh, the LA Philharmonic has been doing game music live concerts, wildly successful. The Hollywood Bowl. Um, there was a, a concert, a classical concert of game music held in Sweden back in 2006. Attracted 17,000 people who were there to hear game music performed. So there is definitely some uh, appeal to game music when it's created in a way that's appealing. You know, um, There's actually, uh, for the first time just in uh, this year's Grammys, there was a track from Civilization IV that won a Grammy. Uh, so that's kind of exciting for game composers. Um, so how do we make money from casual game music? Because these are not console games we're talking about. These are not $50 titles or you know, $59.99 titles. Uh, with a full score that's made by an orchestra. These are typically going to be casual games, you know. They're going to be mobile games, they're going to be in Facebook games. Um, so how do you monetize that? Um, well, basically it's just thinking creatively about utilizing your musical assets uh, for monetization, you know. There are any number of ways that you can sell or uh, charge money to have people take that music, download it, or have extra access to new music that they didn't have before. Um, you can actually, as a developer, you could be selling the soundtrack, you're, you're operating sort of as a music distributor. So um, you take a share of the sale of that track. So if the track is being sold for a dollar or 99 cents, you might take 30% off the top, like Apple does with iTunes. Um, and you could just offer straight downloads. You can actually set up a publishing deal with a composer or an audio house. Um, and that would be something that you may be familiar with where essentially the, you strike a deal where you're, you're owning half of the copyright in the music. So when uh, royalties are paid on the use of that music, uh, the developer who has now the publishing rights would collect half of the, any funds that are made from that track. And the writer or the audio professional that created the music um, collects the other half. As a publisher now, you could, you, you're going to pay a little bit more up front to acquire the publishing rights, but you now have the ability to exploit that piece of music in any way that you want, not just in your game, but you could actually license it to an ad agency for a Coke commercial, and you'd collect half the money for that, and that's potentially tens of thousands of dollars. So um, those are the kinds of things you can do. You could also uh, acquire a buyout license for a piece of music. It's, it's not something that um, most audio folks are going to do without a uh, charging a lot of money, because essentially if you're getting a buyout license, you're completely buying the track and all the rights to it. And most uh, audio folks, worth their salt, who know what they're doing are not going to sell you a buyout license without charging a lot. Um, but it is a possibility. Um, and at that point, you can do whatever you want with the music. Um, basically, whatever profit-sharing model you can come up with, uh, with your audio professionals is going to 
work for you. So um, just remembering essentially that music is an asset because everyone likes music. Uh, I, can, I can name dozens of people that I know that aren't into games, but they all like music. So every gamer, you can be guaranteed, likes music. Uh, not all of them may like the music that's in the game they're playing, but in those cases where the music is really an integral part of it, of the experience, people are going to be interested in buying that soundtrack because uh, in a way, musical soundtracks is, uh, are a way to re-experience that game when you're offline. So, you know, for instance, you bought the soundtrack to Star Wars back in the 70s. When you couldn't watch it on DVD at home, you could listen to the soundtrack and re-experience Star Wars, you know. Um, and I, I have game soundtracks I've purchased because the games, I no longer play them, but I can listen to the soundtrack and sort of re-experience that feeling of being in that game environment that I really enjoyed. Um, so music is an asset because everyone likes music. Use the asset. Think about ways that you can monetize that. I'm going to go through some, uh, some basic successes and failures, uh, sort of case studies. Um, that I've experienced personally. I released uh, two albums. I'm going to go into a third album that's a game soundtrack. The first one was uh, the soundtrack for Ramp Champ, which was a fairly successful uh, iPhone game. It uh, came out about a year and a half ago. And it had uh, about 13 tracks of music. I did some of them. There were two other composers involved. Um, I basically proposed to the developers that we release the soundtrack as an album in iTunes. And, uh, we actually added two bonus tracks and uh, some remixes. So the, the total number of tracks on the album was 16 tracks. Uh, as you know, in iTunes, anything over 10 bucks, the, the album basically sold for $10. Um, the game itself sold for $5. There was a direct link, easy access for the players. If they're listening to the soundtrack, they're playing the game, they basically could, oh, buy the soundtrack here. They'd click on their iPhone, take them right to iTunes, they could download the, sound, the soundtrack right there. They could buy individual tracks or uh, the whole soundtrack. It was uh, moderately successful. Um, the game itself wasn't a huge seller, but uh, considering that, uh, we actually sold uh, the fair number of copies of the entire album and then lots of uh, individual tracks. Um, we're sort of experiencing the long tail. We're still making some small sales on that album and came out a year and a half ago. So, um, and the way that we worked out the sort of sharing of uh, income on that was I served as a record label. The developer really didn't have to do anything. Um, I, I released the album and I paid them royalties quarterly. And as the developers, they're getting royalties on the sale of the music because they enabled it and they, they, uh, they went along with it and they put the, um, the link in their game. So that was sort of an exchange. I also pay the artists uh, royalties and then as a record label, I collect some money off the top. Um, that was moderately successful. Uh, another album I released was a compilation album. Not as successful. And uh, there's some reasons that I have, uh, some theories about why that was. Um, partly, it's because I think uh, it was set up much the same way, uh, except instead of being an entire soundtrack for one game, it was, mm, I think, eight different games and 11 tracks. Um, so each game had one or two tracks, and uh, if you were playing this game, you're like, oh, I really like the theme music to this game. There was a link, oh, I can just buy that track, and it would take you to iTunes, you could download it. Um, but then you arrive at the album, and there's like some 10-odd other songs that you really haven't heard, and you're not really interested in buying because you don't know them. You don't have any sort of contextual association with the track, unless you've played the games that they came from. Um, it was only 11 tracks, so it was 10 bucks for the whole album of only 11 tracks. Um, sales were not that great. Uh, musical budgets, too, on most of these tracks was a lot smaller. On the Ramp Champ, they actually put a lot of money and time into crafting a, a, a really cohesive, full soundtrack. Um, whereas these were in, essentially one-offs, you know, maybe a main theme or a, or a title track, um, one or two tracks uh, in the compilation. So it just wasn't, uh, wasn't a great seller. Um, the third case study was not an album that I released, but uh, this was an album that was released independently by um, the composer who worked on a game called Super Meat Boy. I don't know if you're familiar with Super Meat Boy. It was a wildly successful uh, indie game that was released on Xbox Live. It's like a basic platformer, but um, uh, it was also released on the PC, and now it's on Steam as well. So. Um, the, tr the full soundtrack had 34 original pieces of music. 
um, the, they were not available right through the game. You couldn't just click in the game and go purchase them. So that means that people actually had to go seek it out. Um, the, the soundtrack actually sold really well. It was uh, released on Bandcamp, which is a, an independent website for, for musicians to upload uh, music, and you can just sell it essentially at whatever price you want. Um, he offered all 34 tracks for $3.99, and it was the number one album on Bandcamp for several weeks running. And this is a game soundtrack. Um, and this Bandcamp has you know hundreds of thousands of bands who all up their, their music and uh, some quite popular ones as well. So uh, game soundtrack being number one on Bandcamp was pretty big. Got over 4,000 likes on Facebook. The soundtrack to this game. Um, in in my book, that's a pretty big success. Um, so what do we see there? The the, rate, the cost of the game itself was about fifteen dollars. The entire 34 track soundtrack was four dollars. So there's a really good value proposition. Um, people, people loved it. Um, so, uh, so what kinds of things do we learn from, from these different uh, case studies? Uh, well, one of the things that seems to matter is that um, quality matters. The quality of the music uh, does actually matter, and the quantity of the, of the music, of the content in your game actually matters too. Um, and there's a, couple, there's a couple things I can sort of back those up with. Um, People like music that's good. They don't like music that sucks, obviously. So uh, that's, that's a pretty obvious one. Musical clip art is not going to sell. So a lot of game developers want to skimp on the audio budget. Um, they're just going to go to one of these licensing, um, sort of one-stop uh, music licensing websites. And you know, they pay 25 bucks for a license, and they can use it. Well, so can anyone else for their little you know, infomercial that they're, they're putting up on the public access TV station. And then that's your game music. So. Um, Commissioning music that fits your game, really putting the time and the effort and the money into getting music that's going to create an overall production value increase for your game is important. That's, that's something that you can sell. Um, you're not going to be able to sell something, A, because uh, that you got from a website, A, because you don't own the rights to it, and uh, essentially they've just licensed you to use it. Um, if you're working directly with a composer, and uh, you're getting music that's finely crafted and has an overall totality of sort of uh, context for your game, people are, people are going to respond to that. And that's something that you can work out directly with the audio house and go like, hey, let's do something together. We'll sell the soundtrack, and uh, you can collect some money, and we'll collect some money. Um, you know, a strong soundtrack just increases the production value overall of your game. Uh, music that's memorable and evocative is going gonna, is gonna to sell. Um, and the quantity, you know, more music in your game is actually a feature. Uh, you can't advertise your game and say, like, hmm, one original track of music. That's not a feature. You know, it's like, oh, great full 3D environments and, uh, you know, 24 levels of, of interactivity and one original piece of music. That's, that's not a feature. But if you say, and 30 pieces of original music, that's a feature. So that, that really pluses the production value of your game. Um, and that's something that you can then, you know, if you've got 30 tracks or even just 15 tracks in your game um, that are sort of cohesive, really feel like uh, the game in audio terms, people will listen to that offline. You know, they're, if they really like your game, they're gonna be like, I'll get the soundtrack because when I'm done playing all 30 levels of the game, I don't wanna go back and play the levels of the game, but I'll listen to the music and you, you get that recreation of that feeling. Um, and more music selling at a low price is a great value proposition. People may, for like freemium games, uh, well, they haven't really paid much, and there's uh, maybe a micropayment system, and they're like, I think I can buy you know, 20 tracks at five bucks. That's a good deal. You know? If they like the music enough, they can even just chuck a couple of the tracks they don't like that much and still have a good deal. So um, you know, the more music, the, the better people feel about like, getting a good deal. Um, so some possible models for monetizing music in the casual game sphere. Uh, developers can do things like uh, customize the game experience, offering music to essentially uh, like a, a musical skinning of your game, you know, your, your Farmville or whatever, you want to go goth, maybe you can you pay a, a micropayment or, or virtual goods and you, you turn it into, you know, gothville. Uh, now you've got a new soundtrack to go with it. Um, you can offer an alternate playlist. You know, maybe people are getting a little tired of that same one minute loop and they've been playing the game for hours and hours. Offer them, uh, oh, well here's a selection, a whole new playlist of, of music that you can, you can uh, purchase. Um, or you can, you know, it's a, it's a virtual, virtual uh, 
essentially a virtual goods, a uh, new playlist of music. Um, you can actually offer musical downloads. And again, you just would share uh, the proceeds with the artist in whatever way is equitable for both parties. Um, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, like a specific percentage split. You can just, whatever you work out and sign a contract with, that's gonna be good, that can work. Uh, you can offer downloads directly, you're, you're operating as a distributor and you're just paying um, the developer, you're paying royalties to the artist, you're keeping some of that yourself. Um, if you actually have acquired the publishing rights, then you're keeping like a larger, you're keeping like 50% of any sales that you make. So um, that's uh, any kind of combined income sharing can work. Um, you can actually serve as a sort of a virtual record label in your game. What's to stop you from contacting a band you really like that doesn't have a record deal? Say, hey, we'll release your album and we'll sell it through the game, your entire album. Um, what's to stop you from contacting two, three, four, five different bands? Um, or, you know, jazz groups or, you know, whatever sort of musical um, interest you have. You can, you can just make a deal with them like, hey, we'll get your music in our game and we'll sell it and we'll collect a little off the top and give you the rest of the money. Um, a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot of bands that would love to do that, especially with something that's got like 40 million players on Facebook. Sure, I'd, I'll give you my music for free if you're gonna try and sell it to 40 million people. Go for it. Um, and then just give me, you know, just pay me. <laughs> uh, so as a musician, that's appealing to me. And uh, as a developer, it would seem to be appealing as well. Um, I mean, you, any kind of game refresh that a developer is going to be doing, you know, new levels, new scenarios, new skins, you can throw new music in there. It sort of gives people an additional reason to upgrade the title or, um, you know, it's, it's added production value. Um, so essentially, what's the takeaway? I'm going to wrap this up because I think I'm just about at my 15 minute mark. Actually, I'm a little bit over, so sorry about that. Basically, just getting creative with thinking about music as an asset that you can monetize, as an asset you can sell. You're a game developer, but you're commissioning some some uh, music. You can you can work out ways to sell that to make some money off that yourself. Um, music is a feature of your game. It's not an add-on. It's not just background. It's it should be a feature. You know, treat it as such, and uh, you can make some extra money off that. You can just sell music, pretty much whatever way uh, suits you and uh, the artist. And I think I'll, with that, I'll wrap it up. Sure. I'll hand it off to uh, Aaron. Thank you, David. That was great. Up next, we have Aaron Waltz from Waltz Music. So actually, um, David, David, you said many things that I feel exactly the same way about. Um, I'll just try to fill in the blanks with some things that I've done and that I think are also good um, to try. Um, I've actually, I'll confess, I, I've been a video game music fan since I was like six. So um, I came from that background. I mean, I've trained as a musician and had you know piano lessons and everything around that same age and played video games at the same time and decided I wanted to do that for my life. So I really like game music and I own a lot of game soundtracks. And I've been aware, as David pointed out, that in Japan, game soundtracks um, have been quite big for quite a long time. And so um, a lot of well-known, very famous composers over there have become basically rock stars. Um, people like Nobu Uematsu, who um, did all of the Final Fantasy music. Um, and he's come here, I believe, too, and given a concert of Final Fantasy music. And I know Video Game Live's, Live um, is all over the place, and I've seen them in San Francisco, where I'm based. Um, so that was happening, and meanwhile, I was trying to get into the game industry here and seeing that game music was not kind of respected in the same way. And so from the very beginning, I took a different approach um, to the way that I, I made music um, and I really wanted to try to um, monetize it as well um, and, and create something that people wanted outside of the game. And so um, I started a publishing company and I read a lot of books about music publishing and rights and I became an ASCAP member. And, <laughs> and um, um, that was so that I could um, keep all my, my rights um, to what I've, what I've done. Um, there are some game developers who don't want that kind of arrangement, and so there are times where you give away your rights, um, but as David mentioned, like you have to buy my soul. 
essentially to do that because <laughs> I want to make sure that I have you know a healthy life that with money that's coming in throughout my whole life and so I'm responsible trying to keep my rights in whatever kind of contract I can work out to do that um, so one of the arrangements I've worked out is that um, with certain developers uh, they will agree to let me keep the rights I cannot license it to anyone else except for that particular game company um, however, um, in return for keeping my rights, um, I also produce a soundtrack basically kind of for myself but also for the game developer. Um, I, I make that available to the game developer. Um, I help advertise it for the game developer. I brand the CD appropriately according to what the de game developer wants, so with the logo of the, the company and all of that. Um, I listen to the fans as far as what tracks they might want on there. Um, and I have um, produced physical CDs, um, although nowadays I've focused a lot more on digital because not very many people buy physical CDs compared to the old days. But um, uh, I became a CD baby member back in the day when that was like the thing to do. Um, I think it's kind of moved on. There's some other options, but CD baby's still viable. Um, because they'll help you get into iTunes and Amazon um, MP3 store and a bunch of other um, uh, st online stores. Um, and so basically, you know, you can publish this, this music because you own the rights to it and you want to do it all properly through ASCAP and, you know, like write in all your tunes and all of that. And uh, um, I get random ASCAP checks. It's wonderful. I love it. And uh, then you get the CD sales as well. Um, and then sometimes a game developer might want some kind of cut for that or, or whatever you work out. And I'll leave that to your design. But I'm just going to pass out a couple of CDs that I did for Amaranth Games when I did, when I did Aviond. So these are soundtrack CDs that I've produced. And so they're all on iTunes and Amazon and all of that. And um, it's wonderful because it takes care of itself. And CD Baby also and other stores that are around, like they'll take care of the distribution for you. So people order them directly. And when they run out of stock, you send them more. So, and they do take a cut, but it's very small. Um, if you get enough downloads and you become reputable as a seller, um, you, can, you can work directly with iTunes basically and you don't have to go through CD Baby but that's the place to start. Um, another alternative is TuneCore. And back in the day, they were the only ones that allowed you to uh, just release digitally. You didn't have to have a physical CD because CD Baby required that you had a, a, a physical CD, but that's not the case anymore. They'll let you do digital only, which I'm old fashioned and I like holding a CD in my hand, so. <laughs> but honestly, I buy most of my music now on iTunes or Amazon. Um, so that's there. Um, let's see, what else was I going to say? Like David said, like game music takes me back to a place, you know, that I remember that's happy. And for a lot of gamers, that's why they want to do this. Um, it's something that, you know, tunes bring about memories, they put you in a place. Um, in the game, often the music is a lot more compressed than it would be um, in your studio. And that's certainly the case for Avion. Um, when I did Avion, you know, everything's totally high fidelity. I, I recorded most of it orchestrally. Um, and unfortunately, you know, when you compress it down into 128K MP3 or worse, it's actually worse, I think. Um, you're going to lose a lot of that depth. And, and the average player doesn't really know that, but they certainly know the difference when they buy a CD and it's CD quality and all that. So I think that's another benefit. And then you can listen to any song you want at any time without going into a particular area. And for any of you who know like a, a vast game, like, a, like an RPG, um, it has like, you know, 30 songs, 20 to 30 songs per game. And so you're not going to be able to access those areas really easily and quickly and listen to that tune. But if you have it on a CD, you can just go to wherever you want. Or on your computer, you can put it on your iPod or whatever you want. Um, so a couple of other things that, that I've done monetizing or heard about monetizing. Um, one thing is uh, I've done two things. Um, one was I created a, like a, sampled, a sampled soundtrack. So used all samplers, 
no live instruments for a game. And then as an experiment, because the developer did not want to pay for uh, musicians to play, but um, I wanted to include live musicians. And so I worked out something with the developer where I hired um, violinists and, and other, you know, basically all the orchestral players to come in and play play the songs. And then we included this as a as a as an upgrade, a musical upgrade. And um, I sold this with the permission of the developer uh, on Plymus. And uh, basically, people could go and download the orchestral version to the game for five ninety nine, and that would replace all of the the um, the sampled music. And this was very successful. Um, but again, this is a genre very specific. This was for an RPG, and Generally, RPG players like good music. Um, it might be more difficult to transfer into every single game genre, but I do strongly believe that if it's good enough and appropriate enough in that style, uh, you can definitely be successful with this sort of thing. And just thinking out of the box, you know, the developer says they don't want that. Okay, we'll figure out how you can make that happen. Um, obviously, with their buy-in. Another thing is, uh, for another game, uh, they didn't want to, uh, ha they didn't have a big enough uh, uh, footprint, audio footprint, they didn't have enough uh, memory to put in the voiceovers of a game. And I said, oh, I think this game will be so great with voiceovers, you really need voiceovers. And so what I did was I recorded the voiceovers and included it as an upgrade pack. And so people could download that, and instead of getting the text on the screen, it would be read to them. And so, again, that was a creative way to like make the overall product better, make the developer happy, um, and make some money on the side to pay for the voiceovers, obviously, and beyond that. And people still buy it, and that's long paid for. So that just continues to come in, which is, you know, the more things you can do like that, because music business gets slow sometimes. And when you have those royalties coming in, when you, when you don't have a lot of custom stuff, that's, that's a real windfall. Um, the other one that I've heard of recently, and I haven't really gone in and played with it, but I did the music for Ravenwood Fair um, for LOL Apps, and they are now selling my track as, uh, as a micropayment. <laughs> so you can uh, play the music sh for a short time, and then I think it stops playing, <laughs> and you have to like buy it to hear it more, yes. which is like brilliant. Because <laughs> it's like, well, now where'd it go? And I think they've added more tracks now. I'm not sure, but in any event, that kind of idea in the social social gaming is is I think that's wonderful because um, you know how many how many all of them involve buying like special clothing and and special quests and all of that, and and involving the music I think is is totally totally great. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, that's kind of it. Let's see. Da, 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 da. I did that. I did that. I did that. I did that. Oh, so yeah, I was just going to say, like, I follow iTunes and game music a lot. Like, I always log on because back in the day when, when iTunes was, like, really new, I would log on and I would say, I can't buy any game music here. None. It's not there. I'd have to, like, find it online, you know, and it wasn't for sale. So you just, like, download it or whatever, you know. But, like, now it's not the case. Like, people have gotten really savvy and smart, and I love that. And so, for example, like, Final Fantasy music, like, there was nothing you could buy online except for remixes. And so you'd find a lot of DJs would make remixes of Final Fantasy songs or Mario or Tetris. Or, and there's, um, you know, uh, the One Ups and several other, like, bands um, that, are, that do cover, cover songs of games and uh, so they were all littered everywhere but the original tracks which you know I wanted those I love the other stuff too but I wanted the original soundtracks they weren't there but now they are I'm just starting to notice it, it they're all becoming so digitally aware and I think you know I think that's a real opportunity because it's happening in, in these, these are older games, a lot of them, and now they're just starting to pop up. Like original soundtracks for Nintendo games that came out a long time ago are popping up. And so like casual games and social games and mobile games, I think this is a major opportunity to just jump on that now rather than waiting like five years from now, you know, when it might be, your game might be forgotten. Um, so that's key. And I, you know, I, I bought all the, I, I've bought several, CDs from Japan and imported them. It's really expensive, but now I can buy them on iTunes, so I'm really happy. Um, but I went like I love Angry Birds, 
and I love this theme song too. And so I went and I downloaded it, you know. And then there's there's remixes that people did and all that. I just think that's really cool. So it's really happening. I mean, digital music is really happening. And the more you can create that's for sale, I think the less people will just steal it for free. I really think if you just put it out there, and, and uh, you know, people are willing to pay 99 cents for a track. So I would just encourage anyone to try to work with the developers to monetize this and, and whether they or not they want some kind of cut or whatever. So that is basically what I have to say. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Aaron. Next up, we have Brian Cho from Booyah Games. How's it going? Um, let's see. Make sure you're talking uh, to the mic. There you go. All right. Hey, guys. Um, so my name is Brian. I do business development and marketing for Booya. Uh, we're a small startup in San Francisco that focuses on location-based mobile games as well as musical social games. So um, one thing I really wanted to talk to you guys today about was uh, our game called Nightclub City. It's, um, I guess, arguably the most popular music-based social game out there. Um, total installs, we hit probably around 19 million uniques, so over 19 million uh, unique players on Facebook have tried this game out. And during its peak, we saw around uh, 9 million monthly active uniques, 1.3 million daily active uniques, and we were growing around 140,000 new users per day. So, you know, of course, the power of social gaming, um, virality really made this game blow up. And um, just going back to the game, I think the way that it was uh, created, I think this game came around the time when um, Farmville, Restaurant City, and uh, Pet Society was really blowing up, so kind of the earlier generation of social games. And we wanted to create something that was like more edgy, more cool, that's something that we would actually play, you know, um, something that we could be passionate about. And I think this game really came from the core concept of uh, music discovery. So it wasn't about trying to monetize like the next rock band DLC, but really create a fun experience that you can play with your friends. So it really felt like when you're on Facebook playing this game, you were out like having fun with your friends at a nightclub um, and listening to like your favorite tracks. So I think the cool thing about this game was that we saw a huge engagement, 45 minutes per day per user at its peak. Um, and a lot of that was due to the fact that we let the music kind of run in the background and we actually didn't try to monetize the music in the beginning. And I think what that led to was actually this game being very profitable and um, users really you know, giving us like 4.8 4 star reviews on Facebook. Um, it won the best Facebook game of 2010 according to Inside Social Games and it just got a lot of traction. And I think it's because of the fact that we were focused on delivering a great experience before we were trying to monetize like any of our users through the music or the MP3s. And what this led to was a huge um, engagement as well as impression. And what that gave us on the business side and marketing side was um, we were able to partner up with actual music labels as well as um, movie studios. So some of the campaigns that I'll talk about um, during the presentation, we worked directly with Disney on Step Up 3D, the movie. And by doing so, we were able to integrate um, artists such as T-Pain, Flo Rider, um, you know, all these like up and coming guys like Trey Songs. So we got a lot of like really cool hip music in there. And not only that, we were able to use some of the avatars from um, that represented these real celebrities. So within Nightclub City, you can actually throw a party and invite like T-Pain to come, o come over and party with you at your club and like drink with you and stuff. And um, with Tron, we worked with them to create a Tron City. And if you guys have seen Tron Legacy, um, you know, a lot of the music was produced by Daft Punk. So we were able, actually able to put in Daft Punk music into Nightclub City, um, as well as like have little Daft Punk avatars run around and party with you. So it's really cool, and um, I think the amount of partnerships, content, like monetization, it all came towards the end because we really built out this user base and we had crazy amount of impressions that we were serving every day. And um, yeah, I think that's kind of what really led to it, and that was like the secret sauce for us. So I can talk about um, one of our earlier campaigns. I don't know if you guys know artists or a group called Far East Movement. They recently hit uh, number one on Billboard Hot 100, number one on iTunes downloaded MP3 song. Um, they just uh, kind of blew up and they were like in a small underground uh, band before in a, based out of LA. 
and they were like a hip-hop team. Um, and before they ran with us, they only had around uh, 13,000 fans on their Facebook fan page. And after we integrated them into Nightclub City, where we uh, you know, regularly feature their song, like a G6, as well as um, put in their avatars and made sure the users engaged with them, we saw a huge boost in terms of their likes. So you can see that the jump from August 18th to 20th, you know, they were growing around a couple hundred fans a day. After they integrated their band into our game, we were seeing around 2,500% increase in the first 72 hours, and um, we were getting around like seven to 8,000 fans uh, every two days, which is huge. And I think like music labels were blown, blown away by this, and um, of course, we weren't the main reason why they blew up and they're super famous now, but I think they, you know, if you talk to them and like really talk to um, Interscope about what kind of helped them initially was they did a lot of these like cutting edge music um, marketing campaigns, including working with us, that really drove tons of engagement. And you can see that it drove over 9.2 million minutes of engagement for this game, as well as the brand. Uh, it was a huge win for them. And this is another case study I can talk about. Um, this was a pretty interesting case study or a uh, business deal that we worked with. It was with Kiss, the rock band. So they came to us one day and basically said, um, we're gonna do this live concert and we wanna integrate uh, this concert into your game. Like, what can you do? And I think this is after we had like nine million monthly active uniques and had millions of impressions. Um, and we came up with a pretty creative way to not only drive traffic to watching a live Kiss, Kiss concert on a Facebook game, but also to drive um, tons of quality users to our game as well, like back to Nightclub City. So what we did was we partnered up with Ustream, and then the only way you can watch KISS uh, concert in live was not by going on Ustream.com. The only place on the internet you can watch this was actually by going to Nightclub City, like the game. And we embedded a video frame within the uh, actual game itself to allow users to watch it. And we drove tons of impressions. Um, it's not showing the actual uh, Ustream view count down here, but we drove over 1.3 million video views. Um, CTR obviously was really huge, it was around 60% click-through rate, and we did that because we incentivized users to watch this concert. We essentially promoted the game, uh, promoted the concert 24 hours before, the preview generated, preview alone generated over 1 million clicks, and the preview was something like, if you uh, watch KISS live on Nightclub City on uh, Sunday night, we'll give you like free like face paint, free like Gene, Gene Simmons like costume, you get like spiked like shoes and stuff, and um, I think due to that, like, you know, just users loved it, and we saw a huge influx of North American users uh, engaged with our game. So it was a huge win for us in terms of both user acquisition as well as monetization. Um, this is another interesting campaign that we worked on, Step Up 3D, as mentioned before. This was one of our earlier campaigns, but you can see that it just drove tons of tons of minutes of um, time spent, because I think it fit, fit really well with the game, and we were featuring a lot of um, like really popular songs at the time, so this is more like top 40 music. But yeah, in two weeks we generated like 270 million minutes of like um, engagement, had over 9.3 million plays on the playlist, and over 1,000, I think over 200,000 fans signed up for uh, Step Up 3D fan, Facebook fan page on uh, the Disney Facebook fan site. And the reason we were able to drive all the traffic again is um, we prominently featured these artists as well as Disney, the movie, throughout the game. So the users would just have like a one click uh, click through into the fan page. And essentially that was kind of like a metric for us to say like, to actually go to these like brands, studios, and labels and say, we can drive um, hundreds of thousands of fans to your uh, movie property, your um, fan page, whatever marketing that you're trying to do. And in exchange, we like to use your music as well as, well as get some kind of a premium campaign budget and um, be basically able to create virtual items around your celebrities and be able to uh, generate revenue off of that. And I think the interesting thing that they came back to us on was that you know they said they ha this campaign had greater reach than the two million listeners that they had, had on uh, K-Rock. So in terms of ROI, it was like way better for them to work with us for just two weeks versus like a going to a traditional outlet and trying to do a shout out. Um, this is just kind of showing and recapping some of the campaigns we've you know, worked with. I mean, it's been crazy because I think when we first started our company and really um, worked with a lot of these smaller artists, we worked with a lot of indie guys that just wanted their music to get featured. So we worked with a lot of um, like grassroots movement guys um, that had different kind of genres that no one knew about. And I think through that, we really built out a uh, loyal user base of fans and they kept demanding more music. 
and through our time, we were able to sign up like Lady Gaga, Black Eyed Peas, some of the really bigger music label as well as artists. And that really helped us monetize the game. And um, as mentioned before, for us, it was never about monetizing the music itself. That was a nice caveat for us to have. But essentially, most of our revenue still came from virtual items. Um, what was the best part about the music, in my opinion, was that you know, it made the game. I mean, essentially, without these high quality music from like Daft Punk, or Lady Gaga, or any of our independent artists, like Manufacturer Superstars, to like Sherlock Tones, we would never be the same game that we are today. And um, I think it just really comes down to trying to build a game first and foremost before trying to you know, put like a 99 cent forced buy for like an MP3 track. Um, so it's a little different route that we took, but so far we've seen good success. And we plan to launch this game out in other territories, um, in Latin America, as well as mobile properties. So make sure um, you guys keep your eyes open for that. Thanks. So that's our session. We have a few minutes. We can have some Q&A. If anybody's got a question, they want to ask the panel. Aaron, you want to come up and sit so, so you can be addressed? Any questions anybody has for the um, panel? Yeah. She's got it. I actually don't. I actually don't have a question, but I have a comment. So I'm a mom. I've never played a casual game, but I just have to say thank you to the music industry when the soundtracks for games became something that I could stand to have going on in my living room <laughs> while I was in the kitchen. So, and you know, honestly, when you were saying you could upgrade to um, a more quality soundtrack, there may be parents out there that would like totally buy something just because, my God, they don't want to hear something else for a long time. Thanks for that. That's actually funny because my mom used to tease me about listening to game music when I was a little kid, and she'd go, dee 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 ah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? bands thank you yeah in that game oh, for night Club city yeah um, so we none of our campaigns to my knowledge we ever paid for any money um, and it was because really for us it was promoting the music more so than like using that music to let's say directly make money and the way we went about it too wasn't we never put like the full track up we actually split the track into 30 seconds and we remixed it, so we were trying to promote one album. So if Lady Gaga had an album coming out, we would split that track into like 30 second clips of eight clips, and then play it on the loop over and so over. So these big, big, huge like name brand artists basically gave you the songs to use for free in the game to promote their albums. Exactly, yeah. It was a marketing opportunity for them. But um, I mean, it's super lucrative, right? Because you see Zynga, and they have like Lady Gagaville now. And I'm sure they probably had to pay for that license. But, um, or maybe they didn't, I mean, but then the difference is that the reach that you get with like a Facebook property, like a social game, it's just, um, it's insane. I mean, it's worldwide. You're literally pumping millions of eyeballs that are super engaged every minute. So I think there's a huge value for anyone in the music industry to work with like a social or mobile property. But then you also saw a big increase in the amount of people that played the games when you got the like, major artists on there as well, right? Yeah, exactly. I think so that works in both ways. Yeah, I think music's like awesome um, content update to make sure that your users are regularly engaged. And a lot of other companies like try to create like bigger farms and like like cuter animals or something. But for <laughs> us, it was having like the coolest songs. So I think um, that was really what got users to come back every week. Excellent. Good question. Anybody else? Okay, well, uh, coming up this afternoon, we have Sean Lamone from ASCAP, who's going to talk more about the ASCAP side of things with regards to music and games. We also have uh, Mona Ibram, who's going to talk about the legal aspects of it. She's an attorney, and uh, so it should be really interesting. Thanks for coming. Five-minute break. And we'll take a five-minute break. Cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs>